as well. Perfect. And as it turns out, if we have a leaky gut, we're likely to have a leaky brain. Normally, if you're completely healthy, the lining cells that line our gut and line our brain have uh, what we call a very tight junctions or cement between the cells. And they do a, a very fine job of keeping big things out and letting in only the very tiny molecules that are biologically active doing the things we want to have happen in our brain and in our bloodstream. In our small bowel, we have 100 trillion bacteria, yeast, and parasites that live there and will digest her food, break things down, and make quite a number of biologically active compounds that will get into our bloodstream. What we've observed is that uh, depending on the bacteria that live in our gut, they sometimes begin to dissolve that cement. And so then the small bowel begins to be leaky, uh, letting out uh, big, incomplete incompletely digested proteins into the bloodstream, where our white blood cells, which have been sitting uh, by the gut inspecting molecule by molecule what's coming through the gut, will say, wait a minute, that molecule is too big. It must be in an, a troublemaker, an invading organism. And so they will mount a huge immune response to attack these molecules that are coming across. Uh, for example, if you have a leaky gut and the protein in wheat and dairy, that, so that would be casein uh, as in dairy, uh, gluten as in wheat, if they get into the bloodstream, that person mounts a big immune response uh, and it, it revs up the inflammation in the bloodstream. Now, often, uh, people with a leaky gut will also have the same amount of leakiness in the brain, which lets these bigger molecules get into the brain, inciting a big inflammation response. So the, the root cause of the problem is the high-sugar, high-carbohydrate diet, leading to the leaky gut, which uh, sort of dissolves the cement in the gut, there's a similar dissolution of cement that occurs along the brain. And molecules that are too big escape into the bloodstream, creating a lot of ruckus, so to speak. And often in that same individual, those big molecules get into the brain, again, creating more ruckus. So the brain-blood barrier, that was the longer description, is what exactly? It's a mechanism? The brain-blood barrier, uh, there's a very tight lining that would separate the bloodstream contents from the brain. So you have to go through several filters to get into the uh, clear spinal fluid that's bathing the brain. And if one has an infection of the brain, that barrier becomes leaky. Uh, for example, people with MS are more likely to have leakiness of that uh, barrier. Uh, we're beginning to realize that if you have a leaky gut barrier, you're more likely to have a leaky brain barrier. And so uh, proteins that are too large get into the brain. Uh, in that, uh, the, white, the immune cells in the brain don't like that, and so they rev up their uh, inflammation response, which is pretty toxic for brain cells, really creates all sorts of problems for us. You talked also about neurotransmitters, serotonin and norepinephrine. Norepinephrine, (laughs) Norepinephrine. serotonin. Another couple are dopamine, glutamate, uh, glutamine. So in psychiatry, we're we're very excited uh, to understand which neurotransmitters seem to be important with what emotional states. And so... uh, and I've prescribed these medications uh, many times myself for people with severe anxiety, depression, rage issues. Now that I understand brain biology much more effectively, I realize that I can influence uh, how we make neurotransmitters by food. Uh, And that 
uh, and I explained to my patients that if we don't address the food, the building blocks for how you make the neurotransmitters, these drugs will be far less effective or completely ineffective. Um, it's just critical that we teach people how to eat so they have the building blocks to make the neurotransmitters and to make them in the proper balance. You know, you talk about food as medicine. Yes. Isn't food chemistry, too? Oh, absolutely. I mean, food is chemistry. It's not just this thing we put in our mouths. It's chemistry. It, it, it's the chemistry. We, you know, you and I are alive because of chemical reactions. When those reactions stop, we're dead. If we don't have the right building blocks, those chemical reactions will happen improperly or not at all. And as we accumulate more and more improperly made molecules, that is broken chemistry, then our bodies will deteriorate. I will have problems with my mood, with my attention, with my energy, my blood vessels will get stiff, my heart gets stiff, I, I can't make as much insulin. And the docs, they're trying to help, they're doing drugs for the patient as best they can. But the root cause of the problem is the broken chemistry. And the root cause of the broken chemistry is usually starvation for the building blocks that we need to do that chemistry properly. In Mining My Mitochondria, sure. page 154, you were talking about, for some people, the culprit being eggs and grains. Sensitivities, yeah. Sensitivities. You were sharing, basically, that you had eliminated grains and milk and legumes. You were on a Paleolithic diet. Right. And you continue to eat meat and poultry and fish and vegetables, including white potatoes, fruit, and eggs. But by 2007, you'd gone back to eating rice and occasionally beans. But in that reference, you talked about eggs were as part of the list of a culprit, but I didn't understand a culprit of what. In terms of triggering an immune reaction sensitivity, the frequency, at least here in America, the highest frequency is the gluten uh, in wheat, rye, and barley. The next highest frequency is casein in dairy. After that, it comes to albumin protein and eggs. Then we can get down to the lectins in uh, legumes. Okay. Uh, then it comes down to uh, lectins in potatoes. And then uh, the nightshade family, uh, which would be um, potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants. So you're not necessarily down on eggs, but in evaluating the different types of groups of things that may be of offending people. Because I did an interview with a guy who's up for the Nobel Prize, and we had talked a lot about antioxidants and radiation and supplementation and hormones and so many things. And he said, don't worry about eggs, because actually once you cook them and you denature them, you don't have to worry about cholesterol. Then there's other people who say, don't even worry about cholesterol. But you had on page 160 put down that there are certain foods that we eat that turn genes on that rev up inflammation or that dampen inflammation. Food can either put stress on mitochondria or facilitate better functioning mitochondria. You said try eliminating the common offenders and you had gluten, which I understand. You had milk and peanuts and legumes. But the fact that eggs were in there, I was confused. So maybe it's because of the albumin? It's the albumin. Okay. You know, and one can go on a oligoantigenic diet, take everything out and put things back in one at a time. That's pretty tough. In general, uh, right. what I have my patients do is go gluten dairy free, step one. Uh, and for many, that's enough. They're just profoundly better and they're very satisfied. Uh, but if that is, does not achieve the results um, that we'd like to have. Uh, the next step is to go paleo. Talk about what the paleo is. I think a lot of us think it's certain things, but your frame of reference is what for go paleo? The paleo refers to eating uh, a hunter-gatherer diet. And we know that the hunter-gatherers adapt their food to their locality so that the Inuits in the far north eat you know, uh, a lot of fish, seals, uh, not much vegetable material, and most of the diet was raw. Uh, that's very different than the Aborigines, uh, the Africans on the savanna, the Amazonian rainforest dwellers. So foodstuffs are highly variable. They're local, they're fresh in season. 
and the uh, traditional 